Good morning, church. How is everybody today? Everybody seems very awake and excited to be here. I love it. I love seeing everybody's smiling faces. As you guys can come in and have a seat, find a seat. There's plenty of them up here if you haven't found one already. There's so many great things going on in the church today, and I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, first, good morning. My name is Sandra Jewell, and I'm just so glad that you're here. Uh, if you would like to learn more about becoming a member of the River Bible Church, then sign up to attend the membership class coming up on Saturday, April 20th from 9 to 11. Membership in a local body of believers is how we show our commitment to the church, and the body in turn supports those who choose to call this church their home. The end times class has six weeks left and it's not too late to join. This class meets every Monday at 6.30 and there's also many other groups meeting bi-weekly for community and for Bible study. And if you're not connected to a group, please check out the wall at the Welcome Center or you can check out our website or the Church Center app. It is just so rewarding to be part of a group, so if you're not, I do encourage you to reach out for that. The Women's Ministry has two events coming up soon. First, mark your calendars for the thrift shopping and lunch day on Saturday, April 27th. The plan is to meet at the church at 9 a.m. to carpool for the thrift shops and then lunch at 12.30 and then back to the church at 3 p.m. So sign up at the welcome table, and it sounds like we've got some excitement. I do love some thrift shopping. I always find some cool treasures. Don't ask my husband how many times I might go. Now, on May 4th, from 9 to 1030, there's going to be a plant swap. This one I'm probably not coming to, but it's a great event because me, I have a black thumb. But everyone's invited. Bring your perennials, and that if you have anything that's like, crazy overgrown and you want to split it up, put it into individual containers to how big you think they need to be, and then bring them in and maybe you'll find a different perennial that you can beautify your garden with. And if anybody thinks that they want to be charitable and bring some to my house and plant them, I'm all set for it. <laughs> now, there is a dear uh, member that passed away this week, Eleanor Marr, and everybody, she was just so sweet. You probably saw her in the cafe a lot, and she just served a lot. Um, we are going to honor her and have a memorial here on May 4th at 2 p.m. Um, after men's breakfast. Now, our church has just such a, a giving heart, and that just reminds me of Mark 12, 41 through 44. And it says, he sat down opposite of the treasury and became obser began observing how the people were putting money into the treasury and many rich people were putting in large sums. A poor widow come, came and put in two small copper coins, which amounts to a cent. Calling his disciples to him, he said to them, truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the contributors to the treasury, for they all put in out of their surplus but she, out of her poverty, put in all she owed, all she had to live on. Now, there's four ways to give. You can give in the box in the back. You can give on the Church Center app. You can give on the website directly, or you can mail a, church directly, a check directly to the church. But if you're new here, we're just so thankful that you're here, and we're not asking for anything for you to give. But we do request that you see that, that there's a connection card on the seat back in front of you, We'd love for you to fill it out and to bring it back to the Welcome Center. We'd love to just get to know your name, maybe learn a little bit about you, and then give you a gift for coming today. Now, if you're new online, we also have a digital connection card, and we'd love to learn your name as well. So please go to our website and fill out that connection card. Now, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for the spring air and the, just the beautiful sunshine, Lord. I'm so thankful that we get to meet and just to learn more about you and worship you, Lord. I ask that you just be with everybody and we can clear our minds and just get ready for that worship and to just speak to each individually with us. Heavenly Father, I ask that you just bless this offering, Lord. I ask that you multiply it so that we may further your kingdom and to your glory. In your name I pray. Amen. more than just a building.
a place where lives are changed forever. As churches grow, they often need more space. Money should not stand in the way. Traditional financial institutions, however, may not always be willing or able to lend money to churches. So who can make the difference? You can. The early church modeled their faith by pooling their resources to support the work of the kingdom. Christian financial resources follows a similar model. When you invest at CFR, you are building the church. Your investment earns you interest while making an eternal impact. Partner today in funding ministry, changing lives. Good morning, everyone. We have a special guest from CFR from the video you just saw. And I would like to introduce him. Um, he visits us each year. And for most of you, you, re you remember that we used to be in a high school. You remember that? Frank remembers those days of setting up and tearing down, right? We did that for years. And then just prior to COVID, God blessed us with this beautiful building. And it was Kent and CFR that believed in us and got us the financing so we could buy this amazing church. And so we, we love CFR. We're thankful for him. And every time he visits, I'm like, man, I just got to thank you again because I'm not setting up and tearing down and all that other stuff. So we're very thankful for CFR who, who uh, uses the money that's given by uh, Christians for investments to plant churches like ours. And uh, so I'd like to introduce you, to you Kent. Thanks, Rich. It's great to be back at River Bible Church. Well, as I can say, you guys are one of our, our great success stories Like we, that I like to tell at uh, all my other churches that I go to visit because it's just exciting to see how God is working and using uh, your ministry here to, to bless this community and to grow God's kingdom. And I love that uh, Sandra uh, shared the example and the story from Jesus about the widow's might and her giving. Uh, one of the things we believe at CFR is that we're all on a, a journey of generosity and a journey of stewardship. And uh, that journey of stewardship really starts as we give back to God to recognize what he's given to us. And uh, we have a couple different ways you can partner with CFR. I hope you see the brochure uh, kind of in your seat as you sat down. But one of those ways is uh, to help you give back to God in a, in a very wise and smart, strategic way, just to help you manage what God's entrusted to you a little bit better. We have giving funds at CFR. We think it's a great first step. As you think about how you can use your money to bless God's kingdom, our CFR giving funds are designed to just simplify your charitable giving, it provides some significant tax advantages, and it functions like a charity checking account. It's just a really great way uh, to do your charitable giving. We just recently reduced our minimum investment amount on that to just $1,000. It's a great way for you to give back to God and to bless his kingdom. We also have some great opportunities for you to invest. As Rich said, the only way we have money to loan out to churches like River Bible Church and the 400 plus other churches and ministries and uh, the other churches that are waiting in line uh, for funds is when you invest some of your savings or retirement at CFR. We have a couple of ways you can do that. We have a ready access account. I was talking to a couple of folks after the first service, and they were amazed that they could earn 3% on their emergency savings fund at CFR. And a great way for you to turn pennies into dollars as you move those funds to CFR and to know that your money's helping churches like River Bible Church. We also have our time certificates, which you can see up on our screen. Our one-year certificate's a great rate and a great offer. Uh, it's a great opportunity to earn a fixed rate of return to get away from the volatility of the market and uh, to know that your money is uh, helping to fund ministry and change lives. If you have an IRA, old 401k, you can move those over to CFR as well, and it uh, might be a, a good strategic move for you as well. And uh, so if any of that sounds of interest to you, you say, I'd like to know more, uh, you can see on the screen here, uh, there's going to be a QR code that you can use to get more information. I'll also be in the back in the Welcome Center after the service. I would love to meet you. i uh, love to answer any questions you might have. We have some investment packets uh, that tell you a little bit more that you can pick up and take home. Uh, but we love what's happening here at River Bible Church. We love that CFR gets to be a part of this story and gets to be a part of the story God's writing here at this church. So thanks for what you guys are doing. Thanks for letting me come in to share with you today. So God's blessings. Good morning, everyone. I want to share with you out of Psalm 95 before we worship the Lord together. It says, Oh, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. 
Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods, in whose hand are the depths of the earth. The peaks of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for it was he who made it, and his hand formed the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. Kneel, let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you would, hear his voice. Let's stand and worship the Lord together.
This morning, Pastor Rich, he won't like it if I say this, but he was having a hard time waking up. And he said, I just got to wake up. And I said, well, you got to start singing and dancing. And so we started playing some music. And you just got to praise the Lord in the morning. So let's do that again. be seated. Good morning, everyone. Both of you guys here in person with us today and those of you joining us online. My name is Jason, and this is our time of communion. 
And this is a time that we stop and remember just how blessed we are to be called children of a loving, forgiving, and merciful God. That he cared so much for us that he would sacrifice his one and only son so that our relationship with him would be restored. And during communion, we remember that this sacrifice was one done out of love and mercy. We are to go to the Lord with this very same love and thanksgiving in our heart. And as we just sang in that song, we are to shout of his goodness and dance in his kindness. Psalm 103, or excuse me, 107, 1 through 3 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the adversary and gathered from the lands, from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. It says it right there. We are to proclaim that the Lord is good and remember that through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross that we are redeemed. We are rescued from the chains of sin and from the very hands of the adversary, the devil. Now, before taking communion, we all need to stop and take a moment and do a heart check and ask ourselves a few questions. Are we truly living out our faith? Do we have an active relationship with Jesus? Are we opening our hearts and allowing the Holy Spirit to move in our lives to sanctify us? Or are we just lukewarm Christians to be spit out by God? Now, if we are truly living for God, our lives will reflect it, and it will be visible to those around us. And we must, must let God's love shine through us in this dark and broken world. And let us be thankful for the mercy, for his love and his forgiveness. But we also need to remember that we are to take those things and share those with the very people around us. Now, if you're a Christian, please take these elements and spend this time and talk with God. Thank him for his loving kindness and for redeeming us from the hands of that adversary. And if you are not yet a Christian, we ask that you allow these elements to pass you by. And instead, take a moment self-reflect, ask God into your heart and turn away from your old life and begin a new life living in Christ. Let us pray. God, we humbly come before you, thankful for your mercy, for your compassion, and giving us the opportunity to come to you, to talk with you, to confess to you, and to be your blessed children. Lord, thank you for all that you have done and will do in our lives. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
Good morning. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. What a blessed morning to gather with you today to sing to the Lord, to hear the word of God proclaimed so that God would sanctify his people. Today we will return to our consecutive exposition of the word of God in the book of John as we explore today the perils of false teachers and gain inspiration from the steadfast guidance of the true shepherd, Jesus Christ. Before we read God's word, however, let's take two minutes to welcome and encourage those around us. Let's go. All right. Guys, I have great news for you. You ready? Wow. So each one of these boxes represents two churches. So the River Bible Church will be planting four churches in the northern uh, region of India. 
uh, where they need it the most, where they've never even heard the name of Jesus Christ. And now we will be planning four churches there. So praise God uh, to the two families who devoted their money to do that. Amen. Can you open up God's word to John chapter 10? We find ourselves in verses 1 through 6. John 10, 1 through 6. It is our custom here to stand while we hear the reading of the sacred scriptures. So would you please stand as we prepare to hear the creator of all things through the proclamation of his word. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dennis, and I have the great pleasure of reading John 10, 1 through 6. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep, but climbs in some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But he who enters in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were which he had been saying to them. Amen. You may be seated. Let's pray for God's blessing over our time together. Father in heaven, we thank you for the day you've given us to gather here in your church. We remember your kindness and grace towards us in Christ, and we declare that every day is a day of thanksgiving. From the place where the sun rises to the place where it sets, your name is worthy, worthy to be praised. We are thankful that we have the privilege to gather corporately to worship you in spirit and truth. We realize that you're here with us now, God, whether we feel it or not. And we pray that your Holy Spirit would make the wisdom of your word plain to us so that we can grow from it and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we begin to examine John chapter 10, we're going to need to get some context. So let's take a few moments to set the scene. It's been a few weeks now since we celebrated Good Friday and Resurrection Day. So we know how the story ends, don't we? But let's, let's rewind. Let's rewind back about six months to see what's leading up to the crucifixion. It was the time of the Passover. Jesus, he's in the temple, he's preaching and teaching. There were massive crowds in Solomon's portico, all desiring to hear the words of Jesus. He was gaining a lot of attention because he was doing all kinds of miraculous things. He was literally eradicating disease wherever he went. He was chasing out demons, he was walking on water, things that were impossible for any human being to do. It wasn't just sleight of hand. It wasn't smoke and mirrors. No. It was legitimate, documented miracles that were verifiable and true. And because of these miracles, people thought that Jesus was the prophet that they had been speaking about in Deuteronomy 18. And others, they thought, yes, he is the Messiah. But you also had others who were confused. They didn't believe. And yet there was another group, wasn't there? They were the scribes, the Sadducees, the, the Pharisees, who were threatened by all of this. You see, Jesus had a bigger crowd than they had. The people were, they were starting to see the truth, though, that these men were hypocrites. They were, they were adding to God's law, and they were holding people accountable to these made-up laws that they themselves couldn't follow. Hypocrites. And the crowds really wanted to believe. They wanted to believe that Jesus was going to free them from Roman oppression, but they didn't think that they needed a Savior. They didn't think that. So the expectations were wrong and misguided. So when Jesus spoke about spiritual things, they, they couldn't understand because they were only thinking about physical things. 
It's like he's talking and it's going right over their head. In ear, in one ear, out the other. They couldn't get it. Of course, they wanted the free food, right? They wanted that. And they wanted Jesus to teach them how to perform miracles too. And they wanted Jesus to make Israel great. But that's not why Jesus came. He kept telling them that over and over again. And the anger of the Pharisees was building as they devised plans to shut Jesus up. But none of it is going to work. So they were starting to get desperate. So what did they do? The latest trap was the adulterous woman. Do you remember that? They drug this poor woman out in the middle of the court where Jesus was, and the Pharisees claimed that she was caught in the act of adultery. <laughs> but, of course, they didn't bring out the man, you know, who was also guilty. And because they didn't do that, it raises suspicion as to whether this was fabricated just to trap Jesus. And then they asked Jesus this, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now, in the law... Moses commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say? If they could just get Jesus to speak against the law of Moses, then they would have grounds to arrest him. What does Jesus do? He stoops down and starts to write in the sand. We've always wondered, what in the world did he write in the sand? Maybe he wrote a big L. I'm not sure. And then he counters what they said by saying, he was without sin among you. Let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Brilliant. And they all drop the stones and they walk away in defeat one at a time. Jesus then returns back into the temple. He goes back in there to teach. And he's firing one truth statement after another. And boy, the crowd is getting angry. Not only the crowd, but of course the Pharisees as well. And he ends by claiming that they aren't of the Father. They don't even know the Father. And he ends John 8 by saying, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. I am. The Tetragrammaton, the exact name used for God, I am. They know what he's saying. Jesus is claiming divinity that he is most assuredly the son of God. So out of anger, what do they do? They start to pick up stones. They want to stone Jesus now. Somehow, miraculously, he hid himself and left the temple. And while he's walking, who does he see? Do you remember? A blind man who was blind since birth. Did you know blindness back then was quite common? And some of the people were actually healed of it. But no one has ever been healed who was blind from birth. No one in all the world. And Jesus heals him right in front of them. The Pharisees, they heard of this, and they want to silence this really quickly. So what do they do? They bring the blind man in to interrogate him. Of course, who wasn't blind anymore. And they keep asking him these questions. Are you sure you, you were blind? He says, I was blind, but now I see. They didn't believe him, however. So what do they do? They go and they subpoena his parents. Bring the parents in then. We're going to talk to them. So the parents come in. And they start hitting the parents up now and questioning them. The parents are like, what, are you serious? Yes, this is our son. Yes, he was born blind. Any other questions, go to him. He's old enough, go and talk to him. So what do they do? They go and drag this poor blind guy back in. And they start to question him again. You know he's getting tired of it. You would too. And so he responds, weren't you listening? Do you want to hear it again? Or, you know what? Do you want to become a disciple of Jesus? Now, of course, <laughs> I love that. But they get really angry. And they excommunicado, excommunicate him. They throw him out. You can almost see where all of this is heading, can't you? You can see it. 
And now we arrive at chapter 10 of what we just read. You know, in my seminary's preaching course, one of the main points is that the preacher should prepare his sermon so the people can clearly understand God's word. Well, this section of scripture can be very difficult to understand. I wonder if Jesus would teach that idea of clarity if he led a seminary. Because a lot of the time, Jesus would leave people wondering and scratching their head, what in the world did he just say? Many had no idea what Jesus was talking about. The reason was that he knew the truths of God because he is God. And God's ways are much higher than our ways. And a lot of times, do you remember Jesus spoke in what? Do you remember? Parables, Parables that's right. Could you pull out your outline? Let's fill that in. A parable is a revealed truth, the answer is truth, illustrated by a what? By a story, that's right. Matthew 13 says this, check it out. He speaks in parables to hide the secrets of the kingdom from some and reveal them to others. So he would speak in parables to hide the truth from the scoffers, those who would hear him and say, what, I, I don't really understand that, and you know what, I don't care. It was hidden from them. However, the truth was revealed to those who truly desired to know it. But there's another important point. Pull out your outline. We must also take into consideration that the Bible wasn't initially divided into chapters and verses. The answer to question two, chapters and verses. You do know that those were added later, right? They were added much later to help us. Like, if you want to find John 3.16, it's easy to find. So it works out well. And yet, sometimes it can hinder us, especially here, where we see a chapter change from 9 to 10. And the reader thinks, well, this must be a different day or a different people or whatever. No, that's, that's not true. That transition, there's, there's the same day, the same place, the same people. Even the blind man is there listening. And, of course, the Pharisees. These were the religious leaders of Israel who should have been concerned about shepherding their flock, but instead they're more concerned about themselves. Actually, they didn't care about the people at all. Think about the paralyzed man in John 5. Remember him? They should have celebrated Jesus for that miracle. I mean, this man was paralyzed. What a terrible affliction. And when Jesus told the paralyzed man, get up, take your bed, and walk, the only thing they cared about was Jesus telling him to carry his bed because they considered that work. And no one could work or do much of anything on the Sabbath. How about the blind man? Why didn't they celebrate this man getting the gift of sight? Why didn't they celebrate it? I can't even imagine how awesome that must have been to see lights and colors and to see people's faces and all of God's creation. I mean, they should have give, given Jesus a hero's party. That's what they should have done. But instead, you know what they did? They wanted to kill him. Wait, what? But can I submit to you that it gets worse? Do you remember Lazarus? Okay. Jesus raises a man from the dead which definitely proves that Jesus is God in the flesh. And instead of them hailing him as the Messiah now, their desire to murder him intensifies, and they plot to kill poor Lazarus. Are you serious? I mean, the poor guy dies once, he's raised from the dead, and then they want to murder him. I don't know, Frank, it sounds like they're getting pretty desperate, aren't they? You know what they did? They're supposed to love and care for their people. Instead, they cursed them. John 7, 49 says, but this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. They're talking about their own people. that They're supposed to be shepherding. Does this sound like God-fearing men who want to take care of their people? Of course not. They want power, they want money, they want popularity. Does that sound familiar to you? That's happening today. We are seeing a definitive contrast between false shepherds 
and the good shepherd, Jesus Christ. And as we look at chapter 10, Jesus uses words that people would have understood back then. He uses words like sheep, shepherd, door, thief, robber. You guys probably remember when we were in Romania, uh, we saw some authentic shepherds out in the field. They would be out there watching over the flock, but they also had caretakers that would watch over the cows. You remember that, Elise? And these young men and boys, they would go to everybody's house, they would gather up everyone's cows and then walk them through the street and take them out to, to graze. They would watch over them, care for them. It's the same image that's given here. However, back then, the shepherd, what, what they would do in that culture and time is they would take the sheep out to feed in a pasture and let them eat there all day long, and the shepherd would just watch over the sheep, okay? Now, since the sheep are defenseless, he would have to watch out for wild animals because they would want to come and eat them like wolves. Now, sheep are cute. I think you would agree. But they're not real smart. So they would blindly wander away, causing the shepherd to go and find them and bring them back. Well, did you know the shepherd also had to care for them? So he would look at each sheep. He would inspect it for wounds and, and heal them, and he would pull all of the debris out of their wool because sheep, everything sticks to a sheep. So it was very dirty work. When evening came, the shepherd would then take all of these sheep that were out in the pasture and he would lead them back to the pen. Or as we read, it's called the sheep fold. Now most towns, they have like a common sheep pen where the shepherds would all bring their flocks. The pen had really high walls for protection. It had a paid gatekeeper who managed the pen. So the flocks would all be mixed together, okay? Well, the gatekeeper, he would watch these sheep all night long. Why would he have to do that? Because the sheep were highly valuable and people wanted to steal them. This was difficult work. It was dirty and it was dangerous. A lot of times they couldn't find any grass, so they would have to go over great distances. Sometimes they would face a wild animal or a thief. It was a tough job, and they didn't get paid well. And by the way, it required courage, patience, and love for the sheep. Are you starting to see the spiritual connection here? Okay. Then in the morning, the shepherd would show up, go to the pen. Remember, all these sheep are mixed in. And he would have like some kind of special whistle or a call that he would use to, to call his sheep. And only his sheep would come out and come to him. The, the other sheep, they wouldn't come. Do you believe me? In case you don't, I got a little video for you to watch. It'll prove it. Okay? Check this out. <laughs> One more time. so cute, aren't they? Wish my kids did that. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> get, get chickens. All right. 
I, ho I hope now you have a little bit better sense of the imagery that's being used here. Now look, look down at verse 1 with me. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep but climbs up some other way, he is a what? Okay. What is the first thing that jumps out as you looked at that verse? Truly, truly, right? Okay. When Jesus says truly, truly, what does that mean? Listen up. Pay attention. This is important. All right. What is the first thing that he mentions here in chapter 10? The thieves and the robbers. Do you see that? That's his first mention. Thieves and robbers. Pull out your outline. Let's answer question three then. That represents the false shepherds, the scribes, and the Pharisees who drew them away from the true knowledge of the kingdom and the Messiah. You see, false shepherds want to steal the flock away from God. They want to lead them away. They, they want to fleece them to gain money. They were prevalent back then, and boy, are they everywhere today. There was a seminary class. Their assignment was to research the entire New Testament, and they were to find out what is the number one truth in the entirety of the New Testament. What do you think they came back with? One word. Someone said love. That's what I thought you would say. How about grace? Wouldn't you think that? You know what is at the very top of the list? False teachers. False teachers at the top of the list. Even Jesus warned us about this over and over again, like Matthew 17, beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are what? Ravenous wolves. You see, false prophets are sly. They're cunning. Their words drip of honey. And they mix in just a little Bible to make you think that they're speaking the truth. And since the sheep don't actually even know the Bible, they fall for it, and they are then led away to their own demise. But the truth sometimes, it comes out eventually because these false prophets aren't concerned about the sheep. They're only concerned about themselves. These false prophets lure people in with getting the hope of getting more money or getting better health. You've probably heard of prosperity gospel, haven't you? That's what they do. Come to Jesus and you'll get much more money and you'll be healthy and they convince people with a big old smile, some of them, and they will tell you that you are destined for greatness, like a smooth-talking motivational speaker, and people come a-running. They run for those churches. But if you preach the Word of God through consecutive exposition, if you desire to love the congregation and care for their souls, people aren't that interested. Some are. That's not what the sheep desire. The sheep don't want all that. You know what the sheep want? They want you to pet them and tell them how pretty they are. So they're easy prey then for a thief and a robber. I got to tell you, I watch hours of videos almost every week to educate myself on modern day wolves, thieves, and robbers. Hours. Sometimes I get so angry, I just have to turn it off. And I weep for the Lord to see where the church has gone. I found myself many times praying, God, forgive us as a nation. What have we done? We have turned from your word. I just pray that God would forgive our country. I've seen videos. I've seen videos of men standing in a tight T-shirt, pounding their chest, claiming that they are God Almighty. I've seen that. I've seen them claim that we are all gods and we can all do the same miracles of Jesus. Really? When you think you can do that, come on and heal my mom's legs. I've seen their false healings. I've heard their gibberish that they call speaking in tongues. I've heard their experiences where they claim to go to heaven and it rains skittles. I've seen them claim that Jesus came 
to teach this man the saxophone. No kidding. And by the way, if you buy his DVD, God will give you the same supernatural ability. And as we chuckle about this, do you know where I found the video and the image of this? Can you guess? I found that on a website for atheists as they mock Christianity. Brothers and sisters, these things should cause us to weep because this isn't Christianity. It's not Christianity. And believe me, it gets worse. I was going to tell you this story about this next man, but I thought, you're not going to believe me unless I actually let you see the video. It's a quick clip. But this man is going to describe to you how Jesus taught him how to kiss. Check it out. And he taught me three things about mouth kissing. Jesus did. You say, oh, I want to Listen. I, I said, I don't get nothing out of that book. He said, you don't know nothing about kissing, do you, boy? Apparently not. He taught me three things about mouth kissing. Number one, you have to be face to face. Number two, you have to be really close. Number three, mouth kissing is the most uh, preparatory act. Of As if you didn't know those three things. <laughs> now you're educated. Um, the bad part is that church is packed. This man teaches in a so called church, and many attend. Some of the craziest things you could ever imagine, and they do it to sell their merchandise or to lure sheep into their church. And like thieves, these so-called ministers are motivated mainly for personal gain. They fill their pockets with money, they have giant homes, giant boats, and they build their egos through the thousands who attend. But when you challenge their motives, sometimes they can get really angry. You probably remember this video from Ken Copeland when he was approached by a reporter. Check it out. Do you ever do you ever use your private jets to go visit your vacation homes, for example? Yes, I do. Okay. Again, getting back to the comment, you said that you don't like to fly commercial because you don't want to get into a tube with a bunch of demons. Do you really believe that human beings are demons? No, I do not. And don't you ever say I did. We wrestle not with flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. Pull out your outline. Let's answer question four. Satan's aim is to destroy the church. And he uses men and women who pose, they're posers, as true believers to cause that destruction. You know, that's why many pastors, and I've talked to pastors overseas, people I don't even know will be, I remember I was down in Chennai, I had this huge group of pastors, and somebody asked, when do you think Christ will return? Every single pastor said, soon, very soon. We don't know the day or the hour, but there's a sense that Christ is coming soon. To call his sheep home. Why do we even think that? Well, there's a multitude of reasons, but one of which is the great apostasy that's happening right now. The great apostasy. I want you to look at this. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, regarding the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. That's the second coming of Jesus, okay? that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. No one is to deceive you in any way, for it will not come, here it comes, unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed. The Lord will not return until the apostasy has come, followed by the Antichrist. Beloved, it doesn't take much time to figure out on YouTube that the great apostasy is here now and it's yet to come. It's getting worse. Pull out your outline. Let's answer point one. Point one. False prophets and false shepherds aim to mislead and exploit the faithful by distorting the truth of the Scriptures. 
There are two points I want to apply from this text, and let's, let's fill in question five and six for this. If we are well grounded in sound doctrine, that's the answer there, and have a thorough understanding of the Bible, we will not fall prey to deception. Question six, the true shepherds of God warn their flocks, warn their flocks about false teachers. I need you to hear this. If Jesus, the good shepherd, warned about false teachers, then his under shepherds must do the same. We must. We live in a time when it's unfashionable for Christians to criticize anyone. But it is a shepherd's duty to defend his flock against wolves. I have this quote I'm, I'm going to give you. It's taped to my computer monitor. And it stares me in the face every time I research and write sermons. And it says this. The pastor ought to have two voices, one for gathering the sheep and another for warding off and driving away wolves and thieves. The scripture supplies him with the means of doing both. John Calvin. According to the Bible, Christians are like sheep. They are prone to wander into dangerous regions and they are vulnerable to thieves and robbers. Listen to what J.C. Ryle says. Nothing seems so offensive to Christ as a false teacher of religion, a false prophet, or a false shepherd. Nothing ought to be so much dreaded in the church, and if needed, to be so plainly rebuked, opposed, and exposed. Did you know Paul and John, they not only warned about false teachers, you know what they did? They called them out by name. By name. The prophet Ezekiel devoted an entire chapter of his prophecy to describe Israel as the flock of God abandoned by false shepherds. Listen to this. Son of man, prophecy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophecy and say to, to those shepherds, thus says the Lord God, woe, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fat sheep without feeding the flock. Woe to those who claim to be shepherds but focus on themselves. Pull out your outline. Let's answer question seven. The text, this text, not only instructs us about false leaders, but also emphasizes that the true mark of his sheep is their instinct to flee from thieves and robbers. You know, sheep, they only have one defense against wolves. Do you know what it is? It is to run. That's right. Look at verse 5. A stranger they simply will not follow, but they will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Now, I would agree. Sometimes the sheep will find themselves in the mix with a false shepherd. But eventually, they will leave. They may find themselves in a, in a church that prays to Mary, that worships statues, or teaches about purgatory. And it's going to feel wrong to them. And they will consult the Bible, they will read the Bible, and realize that they've been deceived, and then they will leave. Others may be in a church that denies the divinity of Jesus. And upon reading the Bible, they will understand the deception and they will leave. Others might be in a church led by a woman or one that espouses homosexuality or affirms sin. And then after reading the Bible, they will recognize the deception and leave. Praise God that we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that gives us a sense of the truth. Even if we're not fully familiar with the Bible, eventually they're going to figure it out and they're going to say to themselves, man, something's just not quite right here. And they'll seek a church that preaches the true word of God. And if you know of anyone that are in these types of churches or maybe people who just sit around and watch these false prophets from their home, 
Pray for them. And then you know what you do? You go to them and loving them, give them the truth of God's word. That's what we should do. Look at verse 2. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. Remember, the only person authorized to enter the sheep gate is the true shepherd of the flock, right? In this context, Jesus identifies himself as the legitimate shepherd of God's flock because he entered through the fold, through, to the fold through the door. Look at verse 3 now. To him, the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Now, do you see that word gatekeeper or doorkeeper? A lot of speculation on this. A lot of differences from our commentators. Some think it's John the Baptist. Maybe that's who it is who bore witness to all the prophets as they pointed to Jesus. Some say it's the Holy Spirit. We're really not sure. The point is this, though. Jesus is the only true shepherd. What a wonderful promise that's given to all Christians that Jesus called you by name, that you were chosen and set apart even before you were born. Did you know that? Look at Psalm 139. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance. What is that? God knew you before you were born. And in your book, what is that? That's called the book of life. Were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. You see, beloved, once your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, it can never be erased. I don't want you thinking God's up there with his eraser. Let me watch. Perry made a mistake. Yep, he's out. Uh, He's a good boy today. I'm going to put him back in. Seriously? That's not what the Bible teaches. You've seen it clear. God will never erase you from his book of life. Praise God. Revelation 3, 5. Look at this one. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not what? Erase his name from the book of life. And I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. By the way, John is going to confirm this to us in just a few weeks when we get there. But I tell you what, let's sneak. Let's go ahead and look. Go to verse 27, 28. Verse 27, 28 in John 10. My sheep hear my voice. Do you see that? And I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. Praise God, hallelujah, amen, that we will never be erased from God's book of life. Amen? Amen. Never. Verse 4, when he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know what? His voice. Jesus repeats this fact again, that his sheep know his voice. His sheep are going to follow him. By the way, this doesn't mean an audible voice. Like the false prophets and leaders, some of which you've seen on that video, they do today. They always claim, well, God told me, or God visited me. Every time I hear that, I put my guards up. We hear his voice through his written word, which is properly interpreted and applied. And then it's the Holy Spirit that impresses certain things upon our hearts to guide us and correct us, absolutely. But these unbelieving people, man, they they don't understand it. They're just not getting it, Brian. Look at verse 6. This figure of speech, Jesus spoke to them, but they did not what? What those things were which he had been saying to them. Here's the point. Pull out your outline. Point two. True believers, equipped with sound doctrine, can recognize and resist deception 
particularly from false leaders within the church. We got to know the scriptures. Let's review a couple of points that God has given us today. The first point is this. There are many false prophets and false teachers today. So we must be vigilant, <laughs> vigilant and study the Bible to ensure that we're not misled. We have to know the word of God. Jesus has written the names of the true sheep in the book of life, which can never be erased. Can you fill in the answer to question eight? The book of life. Jesus is the true shepherd who is admitted by the gatekeeper. Jesus is the true shepherd and his true sheep know him. Jesus is the true shepherd who leads his sheep out of the pen to follow him. So the question is, are you following Jesus? Are you one of his true sheep who hears his voice? Do you, do you devote yourself to studying his word? Do you commit to weekly worship by attending church? Do you come to church every Sunday or are you just too busy? Does your attitude towards time, money, people, and life's priorities resemble the attitude that Jesus demonstrated? If you are a true sheep and you're not following Jesus, then you should expect to feel the sting of his loving staff as he leads you back to the narrow path. It's coming. Jesus calls all of his sheep to follow him. And one day he's going to call us home. You won't know the day. You won't know the time. Last week, our dear sister Eleanor left us to be with the Lord. Eleanor and Ken, anchors of this church. They've been here since we started. They came to church most every Sunday, happy to serve, even when she was suffering in the midst of cancer. What's your excuse? She would show up here and carry the coffee and donuts and everything so you could enjoy them. They never wavered. They served God's people faithfully, and they've grown so much. I've seen them grow. And, and though I will miss Eleanor, I will. Though we weep because we want her here with us, I get it. We are reminded that right now, she knows more about Jesus than anyone in this room. Right now, she is in the presence of our Lord in a place where every tear will be wiped away, where there will be no more death or mourning or crying or cancer. That's where she is. Jesus called her by name. He called her by name. And one day, if you're a true sheep, he will call you by name. This reminds us that if you don't know Jesus like Eleanor, isn't it time to trust in him? And you might say, well, maybe when I get older, maybe when I get older, I'll do it. I mean, I still got to party and smoke dope and do all this stuff. I got a lot of stuff to do, man. Okay. It's a bad plan. You know why? Because you don't know when your time will come. You don't know. And also, you don't know when Jesus will return. Come to Christ. Believe in him. Without him, you are a lost sinner headed for hell. Call on him to be saved. 
Repent of your sins and confess that he is your Lord and Savior and that God raised him from the dead. And according to Romans 10, 9, then you will be saved. You will be saved. And you, you will be included in his flock. And he will care for you. He will love you. He will guide you all the days of your life. And if you hear the shepherd's call, respond quickly. Run to him. Don't wait. He is the great shepherd. He is our loving God that despite all of our failures, he still loves us. Wow, what kind of a love is that? I want to have that love, God. Those who follow him lack, they do not lack in any good thing. May those who hear the word of God today be changed by it. Let's bow our heads. God, I don't know what to say at this point. After hearing your word, I'm awestruck. Holy Father, by your Son. I can't understand the cruel, cruelty of men that would persecute, spit, slap on your Son who came to save us. But I'm reminded, God, I'm reminded every day I turn on the TV or look on the internet of the depravity of mankind. God, I am sorry. This is a big ask, God, but I pray you would forgive our country. Our country is so lost, Lord. We've lost our way. Will you help us, God, to return? Will you bring back faithful preachers who will turn away from all of this seeker junk and will just preach your word? God, we understand that your word requires a lifetime of study, and sometimes it seems daunting. And yet we trust that you will shine brighter and brighter in clarity to us your word. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for helping us to better understand these words, for guiding us into the truth, so we may walk confidently in the will of the Father. Thank you, Jesus, for calling us your sheep and for never leaving us and never turning away from us. We pray, dear God, today that you will hear the prayers of those who are lost, those who desire to come to you, God. Even now, Lord, as we're gathered today, if there is anyone in this room and they are feeling the conviction of the Holy Spirit, Maybe in word alone they claim to be a Christian, but surely not indeed. When the world sees their life, they don't recognize them as a Christian because they are not holy as you are holy. And so, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would nudge them today, Lord, so that they would get right with you and prioritize you in their life. God, we pray for those who are here or even online who are not saved. We pray that you would open their eyes to the truth, Lord, so that they would get the effectual call of your gospel and turn away and repent and come running to you. Thank you, God, for Eleanor. We love her, God. We're going to miss her. We're glad she's there with you, God. We're glad. We relish the day that we, too, will be with her as we sing your praises. God, I pray for Ken, Tammy, and his family, friends, who right now are so heartbroken over Eleanor's death because they're going to miss her. They're going to miss her smile, her love. God, will you give them comfort this day? Will you give them a peace about all of this? And God, we are so thankful for the years that you've given her to this church. 
Thank you for that, God. May she be a perfect example to all that are here today. In her service, even while cancer, Lord, you saw her every Sunday dragging herself into this church to serve and to hear your word. I pray many will hear this and they'll want to be just like her. Thank you, God. As we all want to be just like Jesus. God, you're, you're so amazing and we're so thankful for your perfect example. Thank you, God, for all who are in attendance today. May you watch over them. May you keep them safe until we meet again on the next Lord's Day. And we pray all of this in the Prince of Peace in our mighty God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Would you stand as we worship together?
sing one more together before we leave this place. May we proclaim that this week. Oh, God, how I need you. May we spend all week praising Jesus and remember that Jesus never forgets a name. More than that, he not only knows your name, but he knows everything about you. He is our great shepherd. And may we leave this amazing church today encouraged by the words of God and declare his word to all who would listen. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, 
according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen.